Welcome to this new thinking for a new world podcast of the Talberg Foundation. Can the US turn today's disaster into tomorrow's opportunity? In this episode, Jorge Castenda, a Mexican educator, diplomat, author, and former foreign minister, talks to Alan Stoga, the chair of the Talberg Foundation, about some of the ideas from his latest book, America Through Foreign Eyes, and explains why he thinks the United States is heading in exactly the right direction. Jorge, you have just published a book, America Through Foreign Eyes, yours as well as a range of others, from Dickens to Marx to Castaneda. That's not quite Tinker's to Evers a Chance, but a much better intellectual infield. The picture that emerges at... No triple plays. (laughs) <laughs> the picture that emerges, at least in my reading, was fundamentally positive, at least in the sense that you argue the country's, and I quote, inherent capacity to constantly reinvent itself can produce all the changes you argue a modern America needs. Do the events of 2020, everything from the bungled pandemic response, money thrown the old fashioned way at everything that moves, George Floyd, deep tensions between Washington and the states and among the states, and all that has followed in the streets. Does that reinforce or undermine your conclusion? It absolutely reinforces it. I see most of the events of 2020, including the bungled response to the pandemic and the pandemic itself, if you like, as pointing in the direction of bringing about the change that I think the United States needs change which goes beyond who wins the election in November, because it's not a question of just winning or losing. It's about doing a whole bunch of things from finally creating some kind of American welfare state, which, as I argue in the book, the U.S. didn't need before, because it was sort of born as a middle class society, except for everybody who wasn't part of that middle class society, the Native Americans, slaves and later the African-Americans, then the Latinos, then the Asian-Americans, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that what's happened in 2020 uh, is very promising in terms of the United States' incredible capacity, as I say, to reinvent itself, to find new ways to address problems, some of which are new and some of which are not new. These problems have been hanging around for years. The issue of race in the United States is not exactly a new problem. I mean, it's been around forever and ever, but I think that increasingly we're going to see um, ways, new ways in which the United States faces these old and new challenges. What do you see going on that gives you optimism that Americans actually want a modern welfare state? Well, I see, for example, the way polls and the Democratic primaries all point in the direction of greater support than ever before a number of the features that something like a modern welfare state would have in the United States. Not all of them, but many of them. For example, a much higher minimum wage. For example, some kind of universal health care, whether it's single payer, whether it's done in a typically American way, which will be a hybrid, which will be something new, is act to a large extent irrelevant. The same for universal child care, the same for free public higher education, the same for a much bolder approach to climate change, and also a much bolder approach to race, to understanding that despite the progress since the early mid-60s and despite uh, very important things that have been done, it's obvious that much more has to be done. And probably you can't do it without part of that welfare state being for African-Americans. And I see a lot of support for that in the polls, increasingly. Uh, It may fade away. It may not turn into legislation. It may not happen. But I certainly see the support there, both in terms of candidates proposing this stuff and American public opinion supporting this stuff, at least for the moment, yes. Well, arguably, those candidates are concentrated in one party, and I would even argue perhaps in one part of one party. But we'll find out in November. That's why they have elections and horse races. But you do have a long list of things that you describe as, at best, anachronisms, and certainly elements 
that are inconsistent with a modern country, especially one that pretends to greatness. Uh, you talk about the tax structure, you talk about the regulatory structure, the lack of major public sector involvement in renewable energies, never mind the real things that you despise about the United States, which include guns, mass incarceration, death penalty, war on drugs, et cetera, et cetera. Is the vision you're describing, and major parts of which I share, limited to a few very important zip codes? And if so, what is the consequence of that in in practical terms? Well, I mean, I entirely agree with you that this is sort of a coastal vision, although I see support in the polls, at least, beyond the coastal states and beyond just liberal Democrats or African-Americans or Latinos. Polls seem to indicate that on a bunch of stuff, you really now have uh, majorities upward of 60 percent, 55 to 60 percent in favor of a bunch of things among the ones I mentioned and others. Um, Similarly, you have increasing levels of support may not happen uh, for things like reforming the Electoral College one way or another, either abolishing it or tinkering with it to make it at least more representative, more balanced, uh, if you're going to keep it. Uh, The same with the issue of taxes, uh, the same with a, a whole lot of, of other things increasing that are increasingly changing in the United States. I also think that as the United States becomes more and more similar to other rich countries, and I give a couple of examples, what remains of American exceptionalism, some people like it, some don't, but what remains of it is also going to begin to fade away. The, uh, the example I, I use in I think I think it's accurate, uh, has to do, for example, with religion. Um, if you ask Americans how religious they are, they all say they're immensely religious. Self-reporting there, you don't get a whole lot of people saying, I don't believe in God. Okay. Um, if you look at what Americans do as far as religious issues are involved, you're increasingly seeing, and there's a lot of work that's been done on this by people far more authoritative than I, you increasingly see how Americans are beginning to look, religious-wise, a lot like Western Europe. That is very unreligious. Uh, If you ask them, they say no. If you look at the numbers, uh, they're lying. If you wander around the Midwest or the South uh, or the Southwest and wander into some of those big evangelical doodahs on Sundays... The megachurches, yeah. The megachurches, those, those are religions. They are highly politicized. They're different than the kind of religious experience you and I, you with the Jesuits, me with the Dominicans, started our lives with. But I would argue not to go into a Texas church and tell them they're not religious because they'll shoot you. they shoot you, which, by the way, is not necessarily a very religious act. Well, I would suggest that through history it has been, but that's that's a different that's a, that's a tangent we should talk about talk about separately. But to go back, one of the things you're arguing quite cogently is that the body politic or a majority of the body politic seems to be moving in fits and starts. It's America, after all, in fits and starts in directions that suggest the potential for significant change. Arguably, the political system, the institutional framework is at least a lap, I would argue, probably a whole race behind. One is the gap between the people and the politics, both politicians and process. And two, whether the kinds of things that you argue the country should do and seems to want to do, at least in some part, require going back to basics, constitutional reform, It's 1780s again. We've got to redo the Constitution because for all the reasons you've articulated. The only guys who are going to reform, who can bring about constitutional reform in the United States are the states that would probably lose from it, which are the small states that uh, that are overrepresented because of the Senate in the Electoral College. But you might think that even a state like Texas or a state like Florida which are not normally seen as blue or progressive states, though they may flip at this time. But uh, they, simply because of their size, they might want to be more representative. 
there hasn't been a presidential campaign in California now for, I don't know, 30 or 40 years. It's a foregone conclusion. Nobody campaigns there. They don't have really presidential elections in California. I'm not sure Californians like that, but it's also true for Texans and has been that way for a long, long time. If I'm not mistaken, I may get it wrong, but I think the last Democratic candidate to win Texas was Johnson or maybe Carter, but certainly not after Carter. And probably, I think it was Johnson. That goes back to 1964. I mean, Texans don't have presidential elections. There's no evidence they want them, but that's a different point. <laughs> but but, but, but to, to the point again, you're, you're describing, and you are, I think of you as an institutionalist. You believe in institutions and you believe in making institutions work. Absolutely. Essentially, you're arguing these institutions aren't working so well. How do you change institutions? Does it require the nation coming together and rethinking? And is that possible anymore? Or does it require revolutionary change? How do you get change, the change you want, the change you think the United States wants, which is far more important? How does that happen? Well, l- let's look at two examples in relatively recent U.S. history, uh, the New Deal and the Johnson domestic reforms. I mean, these were major, major, major changes. They changed the landscape in the United States. They may both have been insufficient or they both may have run out of steam a long time ago. But at the end of the day, these were two periods in time, or even the Reagan years in a different direction. I mean, these are three moments of huge reform in the United States. But let's stick to Johnson and Roosevelt, uh, where you had a sufficient meeting of people and politics, of practice and principle to get these things done. The United States, I think, is capable of huge reform. It has showed it in the past. It doesn't happen very often, I grant you that. Some other countries would say, you probably have to fool around with your constitution a little more often because it's getting old. The Americans might respond saying, we don't want to, precisely because it's old and has served us so well, we don't want to fool around with it. We don't want to tinker with it. And then you can go back and forth with the French who've now had five, constitutions with a whole bunch of amendments, more amendments than the United States has had, uh, or you know, you can see it either way. But what you do have is a huge capacity in the United States for reform. It's been there before. And by reform, I mean institutional reform with real pressure from below. That's true. And you had it during the, in the 30s because of the Depression, and you had it in the 60s before 68, but you had it because of the Civil Rights Movement. And You know, a guy like Johnson, who was not necessarily the first person you would would come to mind as generating the most important reforms in modern times in the United States, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Act, right, Medicare, Medicaid. I mean, Johnson's not the guy you would have thought of who would do this, but he did. And, And those are institutions which are out there now. I think that we're at a similar moment in U.S. history. And I wrote all of this, of course, before what we're seeing today. In other words, before the pandemic, before the protests against systemic racism, and before what may be, may become a democratic landslide in November. Obvious question to follow is whether this is a moment for thoughtful reform, which is what you're hoping for, or are we a risk of something far more radical and violent? are the bumpers that the United States has been historically, other than in the 1860s, really quite good at containing these pressures in fits and starts in terms of change, as you've argued. Are those bumpers still there? I've been in conversations recently with people who argue, no, it's time to burn it all down. Is this a radical moment or can the system accommodate the changes that you, you, you hope that we are in the process of? Well, if, if you go back, I mean, let take an example regarding race, and it's a tired story, but it's still a valid one. In the early and mid-60s, you had Malcolm X and you had Martin Luther King, and you have the picture of Johnson signing the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act with King at his side, and at least metaphorically, uh, Malcolm X in the streets burning things. 
uh, the two things happened and what you ended up with were very significant reforms, insufficient at the time even, and certainly now uh, 70 or 60 years on, quite obviously insufficient. I think you have a lot of radicals in the streets, in the universities, in the communities, of course you have them. But I think you also have people uh, who are sensitive to what they are saying. Uh, you know, I'm not, I certainly wouldn't imagine uh, Joe Biden to being the ideal person for this, but Johnson wasn't either. And if you read what people like Lipman said, the archetypal American liberal, what Lippmann wrote about Roosevelt when he was elected in 32. I mean, he said terrible things about the guy. <laughs> he was useless, dumb, ignorant, but a nice fellow. Um, you know, the leadership doesn't necessarily shine until it does things when it's pushed by the streets, the universities, the pundits, the polls, and people who vote. I am, you know, I continue to believe in the United States' ability to reform and to reinvent, it, reinvent itself, and that radicalism is necessary in the United States in order for the reformists to be able to do things. There are no American reformists without American revolutionaries. The leadership model, indeed the change model you just described, is a combination of pressure from the bottom and leadership from the top. Arguably, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, uh, Roosevelt, Johnson, uh, who are the leaders today? And we haven't yet gotten to the T word, and we're going to get to the T word. <laughs> no, we, you don't see the leaders out there today. I agree with you. You don't see them. The people uh, in the movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, don't seem to yet to be terribly representative and at the same time uh, towering figures, but they may emerge in the traditional Democratic Party, you don't see people. Uh, you ha at some point, I think you had 15 people seeking the nomination in the primaries, 15 or 16 or 17. They, a lot of them were had better things than others, but um, none of them were you know, outstanding. I mean, that's a fact. You don't, they, they weren't there. And among the Republicans, it's hard to see people who could contribute to this sort of thing the way some Republican leaders did, particularly with Johnson. Uh, you, you don't see them. You see Mitch McConnell. Frankly, it's not, you know, uh, as if you're, you're no Everett Dirksen. I knew Everett Dirksen, and you're no Everett Dirksen, someone would say. Now, now you are dating yourself, because I know who Everett Dirksen is, but nobody <laughs> listening to this film. Nobody else does. <laughs> nobody else does, except that he's the guy who came up with the thing, a million here, a million there, all of a sudden, you're talking real money here. So you write that many Americans, probably a majority, see Donald Trump as an anomaly. When I read that, I said, ah, I remember Castaneda as a diplomat. Because the flip side of that is that many Americans, probably not a majority, but a lot of Americans, uh, see him as something else. They see him, I'm not even sure how to describe, but they see him as the, they made him their president. When he was elected, what did that tell you about the United States? I blew it in the sense that I was convinced that he was going to win from the moment he declared his candidacy until about a month and a half before or two months before the election. And I blew it because I listened and read the pollsters and the pundits who all said that Hillary was going to win. If I had stuck to my guns, <laughs> I would have not blown it. And I, then I would have thought, uh, as I did before, I ch changed my mind wrongly, that uh, there was a real reaction against many of the things that had occurred during the Obama years and even since the early 90s, among a section of the United States electorate that wanted something different on immigration, on trade, on the welfare state as they perceive it to exist, which I think we know doesn't exist, but they think it does, that you know the system is rigged in favor of the underprivileged and against them. Um, what some guy was saying yesterday at uh, Trump's rally in Arizona, or when, whenever that rally was, uh, you know, why should we be ashamed of being white? Well, th that's not the point, but it, I think there was a real feeling there. Uh, and 
my sense was that these were people who were saying, look, uh, we want something different from what we have because we haven't gotten a great deal. I think they were looking for the wrong response to a real question and to a real problem, the wrong solution to real problems and real challenges that existed. But I also think that none of what Trump has done has made life any better for any of these people who voted for him, which, by the way, is why a lot of the polls today are showing an, a, a tremendous drain from his electorate. I mean, it's, it's, it's hemorrhage. It's not hemorrhage anymore. It's, it's, he's, he's bleeding to death, literally. It's a, a carotide that's been sliced. He may be able to put it back together. A lot of people wanted what he proposed and then realized that, of course, it didn't help them at all. Well, as you pointed out a moment ago, polls are polls, and they've not been doing so well the last few cycles. What if, and it's entirely hypothetical, certainly flies in the face of everything we think we know about how the election is unfolding now, but the election is not till November. What if he wins? What would that tell you about the state of the union as a foreigner looking, a very knowledgeable foreigner looking at the country? It would tell me, first of all, that um, there are still enough Americans whereby with this electoral system and this political system, you can still win with a minority of the vote the way he did last time and the way uh, Bush did also in the year 2000, but mainly the way Trump did in 2016. But it would also tell me, I think, that maybe there just weren't not enough votes there yet for a progressive platform on the Democratic side. They're, they're just not there yet, but that nonetheless, um, what you had in defeat was a democratic coalition that is in favor of a modern American welfare state, of immigration reform, of tax reform, of education reform, of gun control, of all the stuff we've been talking about. They just didn't make it this time. Very sad, but that's a different issue. That's a, I try to stay away from the election in the book because first of all, it's unpredictable. And secondly, I hope the book continues to be relevant after the election. So let's jump ahead a decade. Last question, 2030, American carnage or American dream? I certainly see an American dream uh, continue to work because I think that the United States over the next 10 years, if it's not 2020, it'll be 2024, uh, will put together the kind of changes, the kind of coalitions that are necessary for those changes electorally, legislatively, in terms of public opinion even, in terms of a sort of the cultural wars. Uh, I, I was very um, enthusiastic about the part of the book, my book where I talk about the question of history and the traditional criticism that every foreigner has addressed at the United States of not having a sense of history, of always looking to the future, not to the past, of not caring too much about history, not reading it, not studying it, not bothering it with, with it, and how I think that it's a good thing that Americans are far, finally arguing about history and realizing how important it is, even if that is done through things like trying to tear down Andrew Jackson's statue in front of the White House. That may not be the best way to get to history as an important issue, but it's as good as any other. And if that works, you know, I'm basically, I'm a big fan of uh, the great American philosopher uh, uh, known as uh, Woody Allen, whatever works. He maybe, if, maybe took it to an extreme, but, uh, uh, but uh, I, I think if, you know, Andrew Jackson is going to get you there and uh, renaming the Woodrow Wilson School where I studied and taught at Princeton, renaming it, well, that's the way you want to do it, then do it. Uh, not the best way, but it, it is a way. And so I think the cultural uh, changes are also very important. There is increasingly stuff you can't get away with anymore in the United States. And that's part of the process, I think, which will lead to 2030, uh, American, whatever you want to call it, renewal, um, new future. I'm very optimistic and hopeful as I've been about the United States uh, ever since I... Uh, first ran into it when I was something like two or three years old. 
Well, thank you for all of that. I'm not sure Americans care what foreigners think, but you've just demonstrated why they ought to care what, what foreigners think, at least the knowledgeable ones. Thanks, Howard, as always. It's great to talk to you when we've been having these conversations. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New Thinking for a New World podcast. We welcome your comments and please subscribe to other episodes in the podcast app of your choice. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.